Hi everyone, I am uh, Derek Slapp, state representative uh, representing parts of West Hartford, uh, Farmington and Avon and welcome to the uh, March edition of Derek and the District. Uh, pleased that you're joining us. Um, and you know, we tried to, uh, in the first uh, segment, tackle some really hot issues that are going to be going on up at the legislature um, this year. This will be airing in March. Um, and so sometimes it's tough to predict ahead what is going to be um, an issue that we're going to be grappling with. But uh, in this case, um, it's not. I know for a fact we're going to be talking a lot this legislative session about pay equity, also about uh, paid or earned family leave, and a lot of other issues that really impact uh, not only women, but families and, of course, uh, us men as well, because we are all in this together. So um, my guest uh, today, my first guest, is our great uh, Senator Beth Bai. Uh, you represent a number of towns. I know yes, West I Hartford, do. but what are all the other towns uh, that West you West Hartford, Farmington, Burlington, and Bloomfield, so uh, quite a swath across Connecticut. Yeah, well, and thanks for, uh, thanks for being on the show. Happy to be here. So so um, I want to start off with pay equity and uh, or the gender wage gap and uh, talk about what is it, why is it here, why won't it go away, what can we do about it, and why is it a problem? Those yeah. are a lot of questions, yes, right? Yes, they are. Um, how about first just kind of defining what it is? Because there's a bunch of different terms we use, too, in terms of like pay equity, which is yes. this theory that men and women should essentially get paid the same for the same job, yes. right, or comparable jobs. Um, but because we don't have that, then we have the gender wage gap. Yeah, right. and could you talk a little bit about sure. that and kind of why, what that is? Sure, I'll, I'll tell our audience. I know you're an expert on this because you've been working so hard on this legislation for two years. I think in the legislature, right. uh, we look to you as an expert. But uh, for the general public's consumption, uh, in the United States, um, women make on average 79 cents on the dollar for, for every dollar a man makes for the same job in the same field. Um, and that's proven out by labor statistics. Um, and one of the things that contributes to that is that women start at lower wages and then when they get interviewed for another job or asked about another job and they, at, they get asked about their pay history, it can keep their pay lower. So it doesn't just have an impact on women, as you said, it has an impact on their families and then it has a really uh, big impact on their retirement. You and right. I saw when we were listening to seniors who were struggling in poverty uh, mm -hmm. and worried about their health care, uh, the, the disproportion, there were a disproportionate number of women uh, who were in poverty concerned about their health care. That's because women's wages are lower, so then their retirement's lower. So it impacts them across their life, and it also impacts uh, their children even as the parents age when the parents don't have the retirement they need to um, be uh, safe and secure and um, cared for. Right. Now, I should say, you know, um, part of the reason I, I wanted uh, you to be on for this segment about pay equity is that we as a delegation, I think, are really yes. leading the way in the yes. state in terms of um, we've been pushing this together for, yes. for a long time now. And so, and I think we are close, I hope, and this will be, as we said, airing in March um, to a, a resolution or at least something that's going to help close the gap. There's probably not one solution, right? Not one right. silver bullet. Um, but if we go back to defining what it is, there are some folks who um, maybe they're playing devil's advocate or maybe they just generally don't believe that it exists. And they'll say, well, wait a minute. Don't women make different choices? And isn't that part of it, right? Um, and, you know, is it really this 20 cents or so gap? Um, and, you know, are we really comparing apples to apples in terms of jobs? I mean, I know we've seen studies where if you look at even among doctors, not just with physicians, but actually digging even yeah, deeper, right. yeah, even right. among specialists, right? Oncologists or dermatologists, the gaps still exist. Yes. Um, but how do you, you know, um, counter some of those arguments that, well, wait a minute, it doesn't really exist. Well, Derek, I think the fact that you're touching on this, I just want the public to know that we're not just saying, oh, women should be paid equally, here's a bill. We've been sitting down with small businesses. I know you've been in contact with chambers of commerce here in West Hartford and in Boston to figure out how they do it in Massachusetts because they passed a bipartisan bill, Republican governor signed it. They think it's good for business um, because uh, the millennials, the young people are really interested in these issues and want to live places um, where they know there are affirmative steps to make sure things are equitable. Mm -hmm. um, so I think sometimes people will say, oh, well, women make different choices. They do, and a lot of that puts them in different professions, maybe different numbers of hours. The way that these statistics are calculated is if they take the same job in the same industry right. um, and compare male to female. Some of it is, in fact, I think that uh, men are better at asking for more money. And so some of this mm -hmm. 
some of these things are things that we can address um, through education and awareness, um, but these practices, employment practices that can lead to pay disparity, I think are very simple to get rid of. They've done it in California, yep. they've done it in New York, and um, I think you've done a super job of engaging the business community, engaging women's groups. I know um, there are any number of women's groups who've been at the table that you made sure were at the table. And this has been an iterative process to do the best policy we can for Connecticut. Right, yeah, it, it's been a long process. You know, it's not easy passing a law. Oftentimes they say it takes, what, about three years or so? Yes. I mean, because what you have to do is build consensus, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. um, I do think, and I'm, I'm sure you probably agree, that pay equity is one of these issues, maybe similar to climate change, mm -hmm. where it's kind of tipped. And people accept that it's here, it's real, right? And it's right. a problem, and right. we have to do something about it. And to your point, um, this effort started, and you, you've been there from the very beginning, uh, last year mm -hmm. uh, before session started and we looked at the Massachusetts bill as mm -hmm. a model and mm -hmm. it passed there not only bipartisan but unanimously right incredible yeah um, and their Republican governor signed the bill it held a press conference was very proud of it and he's by the way the most popular governor in the country yeah. so this is um, not something that is you know you have to spend political capital on so right. to speak and the Boston Chamber of Commerce <clears throat> led the way on it right. and I mean you just touched on that because um, they think that you know fair pay is good for the economy, and um, exactly. when you when you don't pay people fairly, it increases churn, it increases right turnover. It's not efficient. No, you know? and and I think you might have noticed this week in the Hartford Current there was an article that Bank of America right. is instituting this policy. Basically, the bill that we've been working on, they're instituting as their company's policy. That's a pretty big employer with companies with employees around the country who saying this is an important policy. So I was really um, happy to see that Bank of America took that step this week. Yeah, and Amazon as well is, oh, uh, is another big company uh, that's done that. And you mentioned, we should probably talk about the, the specifics of the bill, and there's a number of different parts, but one in particular I thought worth focusing on, and that is that you would no longer, an a, uh, employer would no longer be able to ask a prospective employee, a job candidate, how much do you currently make? So you could say, what's your salary expectation? How much would you like to make? You could do all that. You could also ask about structure. Do you get a commission? Do you get a bonus? But you can't say, how much do you currently make? Because that's about um, really a salary anchor that women disproportionately right, take from one job to the next right. to the next. Right. Um, so it's really kind of a free market approach in a way to say uh, employers should be pricing the position and not the person. And right. I think that simple change could make a big, big difference. Yes, I think it could. Um, and you know, you touched on the part about seniors too, and I think that you know, even broadening it, it's not just about women and exactly. women who are seniors, but men too would benefit from this, right? Absolutely. I mean, I think it sort of levels the playing field, and um, most families now have two parents working, so it really is important for family economic security um, throughout the lifetime. And so, you know, I'm excited. Connecticut is is leading on this. We won't be the first state, but right. we'll be one of the first states. Um, and last year, a bill did pass the House, but in order to get it through the House, sort of the guts had been cut. Right. And so as a legislature, we said, wait, wait, we don't want to do something to say we did something that doesn't do anything. So this year we're back working out the details of a stronger bill. Right, and we have a commitment from the leaders of both the Senate and the House to put the strong bill on the board, so right. to speak. That's Last year, no, one, they didn't have to vote on it in the Senate. So I think it's important. Right, and we're going to vote on that pay history question in the House. I would expect probably in early April. Yeah, so that would be soon. awesome. Um, and we've been working, as as Senator Bai said, um, you know, we've been trying to do this in a bipartisan fashion. I still hope that that'll happen. We'll have to see. Um, but we've had businesses at the table. We've had um, headhunters at the table. We've had people from the industry, um, all different sides of it, trying to get to a place where. Um, you know, we can help address their concerns, but knowing that going forward, this is going to be good for the economy and help Connecticut compete. I think you mentioned Absolutely. that Massachusetts, California, Oregon, Delaware, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, New Orleans. I mean, the list goes on. And by the, you know, in the next month or so, there'll probably be even more states. Um, yeah. Alaska and Vermont are two states that are right now pushing it. So, right. on, you know, opposite ends of uh, the right. country. 
but um, you know, they're still both going off, going forward with these types of yes, issues. Yes, and I think in Connecticut, unfortunately, like our business and industry associations sort of have this no reflex to anything yep. that might ask anyone to do anything. Um, and we've brought them to the table too to make sure that the business and industry associations at the table giving us input and some of their members came to a meeting this week to help us listen to their concerns and answer some of their questions and try to uh, make the bill not be something that they will oppose this year. Right, exactly. Well said. Um, so if you are watching this and you have a personal experience about, you know, feeling that you've been <clears throat> underpaid or um, suffered uh, wage discrimination, um, you know, reach out to us. Um, you'll, the uh, emails will be on uh, the, the screen, if not now, then uh, in a few minutes. And it's, they're, they're, you know, a form email in terms of it's derek.slap at cga.ct.gov. And you have the same Same one, but that's by. Yeah. Um, yeah, or you can find us on Facebook as well. But mm -hmm. we'd love, I think, to hear, right, your, sure. your story, your experience. We're going to need you for the public hearing, yes, and your voice really does matter on this. So um, we'll keep you up to date, um, definitely, uh, on the pay equity um, fight. Hopefully it's not a fight, but, but we're ready to do it if, if need be. Um, I do want to make sure we have time to talk about uh, paid family leave. I know that's something you've really been yes. a champion on. Um, tell me why you think that's important for not only workers, but I, I would gather that you would say for our economy as yeah. well. I mean, like a lot of things, um, for me, and my family's been through an illness this year, this past year, and personally, I was able to take time off from work to be there when my wife was going through a special treatment. But while she was in treatment, I met many people um, who were looking at things like bankruptcy because they could not afford to take time off to care for a loved one and keep their job and have a living wage. And so, I lived it firsthand with many families down at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, um, and I just saw, I mean, literally, you know, I believe my wife is still alive because family members were able to take mm -hmm. time off and help her. So I don't think it should be a matter of the job you have that allows you to do that. I think uh, we are a nation uh, that are caring people, and we do believe that families need time together in those, through those difficult times. Um, so what paid family medical leave would do is to have employees pay into a fund. The Connecticut model didn't even have an employer match okay. where a certain small percentage of your pay would go into a fund that would then be used uh, if you needed to take time off to care for a family member. You know, it's, it's capped at a, at a certain level, um, but those funds, it would almost be um, like, I'm trying to think of a comparable thing. It would almost be like if your company mm -hmm. had paid sick leave yep. or paid family medical leave where you can use that time for medical purposes or to care for your parent. Um, more and more, you know, people my age, I hear, are stuck caring for their parents or if their kids are sick or for their spouses, mm -hmm. um, you need time off. And to be honest, uh, most small businesses cover this for their employees. Someone said, go take time off. Right. But the businesses end up paying for it and filling in. Whereas this would create a system where the individual would be paying in and then with a doctor's note, you know, mm. an appropriate approval, they would be able to collect uh, up to, well, up to 75%, I believe, of their pay for that six, 12, however many weeks the Connecticut bill ends up being. I think right now it's set at 12 weeks where you could have up to 12 right. weeks of paid family medical leave. And you also get job protection, which is really important. Sure. Um, so I think just like healthcare, I think people in this country think everyone should have high quality health care. Right. How do you do it? That's what gets complicated. So there are probably 19 different iterations of this bill, mm -hmm. um, but small businesses support it. The small business majority, there was a poll, 72% uh, yep. of small businesses support it. 80% of residents support paid family medical leave. It's just a matter of setting up the system, and that's where things get held up. But yeah. um, QUELF, the Connecticut Women's Education and Legal Fund, um, has been leading the charge on this as well as AARP because it right. affects our seniors um, to make sure that Connecticut has a strong paid family medical leave. One other really interesting point, I think we have to start to understand that uh, the millennials in the, in the next election and going forward are going to be the majority of our workforce. 35% of millennials when interviewed said they would move to a state that right. had paid family medical leave. In Connecticut, if you listen to Electric Boat and Sikorsky yeah. and uh, Jackson Labs, the biggest challenge is attracting young talent. 
and Connecticut has a lot of quality of life features that draw those young people, but we also need policies like this that says, we're gonna be there for you and your family right. if you move here. So I'm excited about this initiative. It's in its third year. Um, when I was chair of a probes, I was able to fund the study to look at the financing. Yep. Um, so I've been working on this for several years, uh, and Catherine Bailey, who lives in town, has been working on mm -hmm. it as well, and Kate Barat, Quelf, yep. has been working yep. on it. So there's a lot of um, West Hartford support for this, and I had a forum a couple of years ago where we heard compelling stories from residents about why we need this policy. Yeah, it's one of those, th I mean, I think you touch on this, but to, for us to compete in getting millennials and building our workforce, how do we get young folks and millennials, not, and they're not obviously the only ones that are important that we want to come here, but how do we get them to come to Connecticut if we say, well, um, let's say we don't have pay equity, uh, so you're, if you're a woman, you're going to get uh, underpaid. It's going to cost you at least $10,000 a year. Right. Sorry, we know L.A. and California and Boston and all these other places have it, but right? And we don't have paid family leave, so when you want to have children and you want to, right, you know, uh, tend to your family, uh, we don't have that either, and we're a high-cost state, and so... You start these things start to build up, right? Yeah, and they so, add up. Yeah, I think it is about competitiveness. And, and I have five millennials that I parent um, right. who are out working in the world, and their values really are a bit different. They don't want to work 65 hours a week uh, like we have. You know, they want to work hard, and then they want to right. have a quality of life. And with uh, the internet and uh, the ability to travel more easily. Connecticut's a great place to attract them. So we need to go out of our way uh, to develop transportation systems and policies that encourage them to come here. So those who hear this and say, well, that sounds great, but how do we pay for it? We have a financial or budget um, crunch here in Connecticut. I mean, what I hear you saying is that, well, one, this is uh, not mandatory uh, for businesses in terms of the way it's structured contributions, right? Now. right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's uh, employees could contribute as they go, so mm -hmm. they could essentially they're going to be the ones financing right. this, is that right? It was interesting, yes, it would be, it, there's, there's no cost. There are state employees, but they would be paid through the fund. Right. Because someone needs to administer it, just like unemployment, you know, or, right. Right. or other, or Social Security. You need people uh, to do it. One of the most fascinating things about this is last year I met with a major business in the region, yep. and they explained to me, we already offer this. So I said to them, well, why are you fighting it? Because he was saying, you don't need to pass that. He said, mm -hmm. well, I want to offer it so I can compete for those employees. Uh, so it would be and an advantage. I was like, so. okay, you want these employees at the expense of all of Connecticut residents who might need to care for their family members. Like, right, so right, right. Uh, many businesses are doing this gotcha. now. Okay. Um, one other item, uh, I know you wanted to touch on in particular, but I, you know, I agree with you. I think this is an issue and this is helping those uh, with disabilities and who kind of get trapped in a way yeah. in uh, right. emergency rooms. Um, do yeah, we, we need that? to, this is a crisis in Connecticut. We need to address um, young adults with uh, developmental disabilities who have co-occurring behavioral disabilities where we don't have anywhere for the kids to go. So they're spending months sometimes in the emergency room and in the hospital. Um, just without appropriate care. So um, this is something during this session that working with uh, the Human Services Committee, I'm gonna be focused on. Great, all right, so we'll um, you know, see how that goes. You'll be submitting, uh, well, it's a little bit different how it works here, but in terms of individual legislators submitting the bills. Right. But this, this will be, be yeah, that, this right? is gonna be more of an appropriation and uh, working with some of the, um, the committees that deal with health care because more of a Medicaid, some of it, some of it really is departmental policy, trying okay. to make sure DDS, DCF, and DSS all work together to find placements for these students instead of because they're expensive pushing them off. So great. Okay, yep. before we take a break, do you want to tell folks how to get a hold of you if they're watching? Sure, this? sure. Uh, you can email me at the Capitol, uh, Beth dot by at cga dot ct dot gov, or you can call my office eight six zero two four zero. 0420. There you go. Our great Senator Beth Bai, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Derek. Good to see you, you as too. always. We're going to take a quick break. We're back with the segment Slap Salutes, a local person going above and beyond to help the rest of the community. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back to the show. Um, we call the show, as you know, Derek in the district. And this segment, uh, we actually call uh, Slap Salutes. And it's kind of a fun way just to really highlight somebody in our community in West Hartford who was going uh, above and beyond um, to help our neighbors and community members. And uh, in this case, 
Um, we have somebody who is really, I think, um, going to, um, and already has, made a big contribution in our community. Uh, her name is uh, Jenny Stedman. She is the executive director right, mm -hmm. of the Aurora Foundation for Women and Girls. Did yep. I get it right? Yeah, okay, you perfect. did. Um, and, uh, you know, I know many folks probably already know about all the good work that you mm -hmm. do, but if you can, describe the mission of the Aurora Foundation for those folks who are not familiar with it. Sure. So the mission of the Aurora Women and Girls Foundation is to be a catalyst for positive change in the lives of women and girls in Greater Hartford. And we do that through kind of three targeted uh, strategies. We give grants um, to organizations that serve women and girls. Yeah. We um, do research and convening around issues that are important to improve the lives of women and girls. And we do philanthropic education about what is the way to make your philanthropy more impactful and uh, make a bigger difference to the community. Wow, so those are, those are big things. <laughs> they those are. are. And, and to improve the lives of women and girls. Um, that sounds so huge. I mean, how do you decide which issues? And I'm leading you a little bit yeah. because we've been working together on, on pay equity. So maybe we start there in terms of um, why do you think pay equity is, you know, is such an important issue? And what are some solutions that right. you see? Well, so in our mode of doing research, we published the Aurora Report in 2014, which was the first needs assessment for what are women and girls, what are, what's their status in Greater Hartford? What do they need? Um, how do we start to make our, we used it to make our grant making better, mm -hmm. right? To know what were the real problems. So we found that almost a quarter of households in, um, in Hartford County are headed by single women. And that those households make on average 21% than versus households headed by single men. Interesting, okay. So what we're finding is that this is really a question about addressing poverty in Greater Hartford. 55% um, of the people living in poverty in Hartford County are women, which totals around 60,000 women and girls living in wow. poverty. So that if we can start to, to raise the amount of wages that they can earn, right, we're really impacting women and their families and the entire community. Right, and um, why do you think, I mean, you were part of, and are part of our working group on pay equity, and one of the things that we're, we're you know, touching on, and we just mentioned this with Senator Bai earlier about, um, is eliminating the pay history question, to try to kind of break free from the salary anchor that a lot of women face. Do you think that's gonna be an effective way to, maybe not, you know, the silver bullet that cures it all, but do you think that's part of the solution? I think it's a really good first step, because we know that women often come in at a, at a kind of, they've kind of historically made lower earnings. Mm -hmm. And so when you ask them those questions, you're not really, you're not setting like a fair standard for what does that job really, should it be earning in the marketplace? Instead, they're starting off at a disadvantage if you're asking them, okay, so your last job where you were underpaid, let's start you again at that kind of underpaid level. Right. And so I think we'll see a big uptick in, in getting closer to pay equity if we eliminate that initial Why do you question. Think, I get this question from some of um, colleagues, but you know, uh, people sometimes in the community say, well, what, I would never pay a, uh, a woman less. And so I, you know, why, why do women, why are women paid less, right? So well, how do you answer that? Um, well, I think, you know, I think it's a holdover from old thinking about this idea that, that men need to make a wage that supports an entire family. And I think it has to do with um, the really high costs of childcare in Greater Hartford, right, mm -hmm. where families could spend up to 20% of their income on childcare. And so that sometimes leads women to make choices to stay home rather than um, pay those, those really exorbitant childcare costs. So I think there are lots of factors like that that go into some of the decision, decisions mm -hmm. women make that then pull them out of the labor force and when they try to re-enter, they have a hard time kind of getting back up to where they were in their careers beforehand. Right, and I, you know, personally, I think it's, it's unfair that if uh, a woman, uh, or a man for that mm -hmm. matter, but <laughs> leaves the, the labor force, right, to let's say care for a child, and they come back, that with the salary history question helps ensure that they never recover financially. So right. for the rest of their careers, they're paying the price for having left maybe for two years, which, um, to me, and I assume you would agree, just seems very unfair. Right? Well, and it's gonna, I think it impacts our whole economy. Yeah. I mean, we have to start looking at these 
um, when you are, when you and Beth were talking about the kind of larger economy of Connecticut, mm -hmm. right, and attracting um, millennials to the workforce, right? They really we have to, to to grow our economy to have a vibrant economy. I think paying women more equitably benefits everybody, right? That it's not right. just a kind of um, politically correct thing to do, but it makes economic sense. Right, and it goes right back into the economy, right? right. And, it, and I think too, you know, sometimes people may hear this and say, well, it's zero sum, are you taking money away from men to pay women more? And that's not the case either, right? Right, that'll give them more purchasing power. It will, you know, and, and what we find in our research, um, nationally, only about 7% of charitable dollars go to programs that directly serve women and girls which is way, mm, way too wow. low. So that's, that's the kind of mission of a women's fund like ours, is to kind of help rethink the way that philanthropy gets practiced. Right. We know that when women benefit from programs like that, they put about 96% of the benefits they get back into their families sure. and communities. So it's a better way to do philanthropy, and it's really a better way to think economically, right? That if we boost these boost these women and their families that will be bringing up whole communities, in yeah. Connecticut's case, whole regions and the state. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what are some other issues that, that you're focused on right now? I know pay equity is part of it, but you know, you, as you mentioned, kind of holistically, what are you looking at? Right, so pay equity is important to us because our grant making focus right now is on college success and completion for low income and minority women. Because what our research shows is that if you don't have a high school diploma, you make about $19,000 a year, if you're lucky, in okay. Connecticut as a woman. Wow. If you get your bachelor's degree, mm -hmm. that salary goes up to $47,000, okay. right? So we're talking more than a two, a two times bump in your salary, sure. right? So that if we're thinking about families in poverty, right, that kind of income boost can start to lift whole families, whole communities, right? So we're funding programs that help low-income and minority women achieve that college degree. And, and we're funding also programs that help them get a STEM degree, which will boost their earnings even more. Wow, right. So we're really interested in the issue of pay equity because once we get these women successfully graduated, we're really thinking about the world that we're sending them into, mm -hmm. right? We want them, right? Sure. When we've invested in them to get through to have an equal playing field and make the most that they can make. And yeah, and you know, encouragement in STEM, I think, is, is great, too. Um, I was at uh, Conard High School not so long ago and uh, saw their uh, STEM program and their computer science yeah. specifically. And there is an effort to increase um, access to computer science education and classes um, at the high school level all across the state. And, you know, one idea is making it mandatory. We, you know, we need to be careful about unfunded mandates. And right. so uh, that is a concern. I get it. But to help ensure that um, women and young girls have the same access and are discouraged from going into those type of fields. Well, and when you and Beth were talking about Jackson Labs, UTC, mm -hmm. Pratt & Whitney, th they are desperate for a good, a good solid workforce that, can, that has those STEM skills. And so if we can supply women candidates, then all the better for the women and for the economy of Connecticut. Well said, yeah, so, well, great work. I mean, you're really, great. you know, making, I know, a big contribution, and I want to thank you, too, for being part of our uh, bipartisan working group on pay equity, so. We're really happy to. You're, you're making a difference, so. Uh, um, why don't you tell folks uh, if they have more questions about uh, whether pay equity statistics, research, or what your foundation does. You want to tell folks how to get a hold of you? Great, um, you can find us on our website, aurorafoundation.org. Um, and our phone number is 860-881-4926. Perfect. All right, and I'll just give you a little bit more contact information for me because we are wrapping mm -hmm. up uh, and we're out of time for the show. If you want to uh, email me, I'm at Derek, D-E-R-E-K dot slap, S-L-A-P at C-G-A dot C-T dot gov. Um, you can also find me on Facebook. I'm pretty much the only slap around, so I'm easy to find. Um, so thanks again for uh, spending some time in uh, watching this edition of Derek in the District. I hope you have a great month, and I will talk to you very soon. So long.